This morning, we want to get you connected with our family right here at Relevant Church. To start communicating on the go with Pastor Brian and receive weekly event reminders, simply text the word FOLLOW to 541-262-0269. We will have a water baptism service in just two weeks on April 28th. If you're interested in being baptized, you need to make sure you're on the list for the service. If you have questions or want to make sure you're on the list to be baptized, please contact Pastor Brian. A big thank you to those who showed up this last week to help with our church work days, which included carpet removal and some prep work. Work days will continue this week on Tuesday the 16th and Thursday the 18th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. This week will focus on some painting and some flooring install. Remember, many hands make light work, so we hope to see you here. Whether you're here in the auditorium, watching from a sister campus in Oregon, or you're a regular online viewer across the United States or around the world, please minimize distractions, silent cell phones, and thank you for joining this session of Bible Therapy. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey, it's good to see you, and we just want to welcome everybody who's joining us online today. And in fact, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, something, and, and it kind of fulfills the whole purpose of why we why we are enabled the, the the online people to join us, and um, and it's kind of part of our mission. Okay, and so we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. But um, <clears throat> how many of you um, are just really glad that Jesus is alive? Yeah, right. And so if you're, if, you're, if you're not glad, maybe maybe it's because you don't really understand the significance of who Christ is and what he's done. And so, um, so, so, so we've kind of been talking about that for about the last five weeks. In fact, um, we've been talking about the very subject of, of why did Jesus? And we've answered a lot of questions of why did Jesus do certain things? And what we've kind of been really focusing on is really <clears throat> this concept of why did Jesus become human? and come to live among us. And that is just such a great topic, it's such a great question. And that's what we've been talking about uh, because what we've done is we've taken the, the personal testimonies of people who actually walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, was taught with Je by Jesus, um, who, who was inspired by Jesus, and, and because of their work, because of everything that Jesus did and what they saw, we took their personal testimonies and we just been kind of coming up with some answers of why Jesus did what he did. And there's a lot of reasons <clears throat> that we've come up with and a lot of reasons that we've discussed, but kind of the bottom line that we've kind of been underlying throughout this series is that basically Jesus came to teach us and to show us what God the Father is really like. And so that's really kind of the, the whole crux of the whole thing. And the reason is, is that Jesus didn't want to just come to have an explanation of God. He wanted to be the best explanation of God. So we're going to talk about another reason today of why Jesus did. And, 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 and really, all of this kind of funnels down to one specific cause or one specific purpose of why Jesus did so many things that he did. And, it's, and it was all leading up to the idea that he wanted mankind to be saved from their sin. That includes you, that includes me, it includes everybody in the world, it includes all the people that are attacking Israel right now. Just a thought, okay? It, it, it includes all the people that you don't like, the people that drive you nuts, the people that you come toe-to-toe -to -toe with, nose-to-nose -nose with, eyebrow-to-eyebrow -eyebrow with. It, it includes all of those people. Jesus came so that all of us could experience life and freedom from our sins. So today we're going to talk about another reason why Jesus came. And this we're going to wrap our whole series up with this idea today. And perhaps this is the most scariest reason why Jesus came. Okay, And it's really to, to, to recruit us for his mission. Okay, That's the reason why Jesus came. That's one of the reasons is to recruit us towards his mission. So how many of you, um, you, how many of you remember the 80s? Anybody here remember the 80s? It was like a great, great decade to grow up in. Um, I was a teenager, well into my teenage years during the 80s. And uh, boy, they just had some good music, didn't they? Since then, I don't know what happened. You know, it just, 
It, now, now that's considered classic music, but there, there, there's a couple of significant things that happened in the 80s. <clears throat> do, you, do anybody remember um, the first Gulf War and how all that started? That started to, to develop in the late 80s and the early 90s. And I had just graduated high school whenever uh, the first Gulf War was, uh, was beginning. And Iraq had just invaded a little country called Kuwait. Anybody remember all that? Okay, there was a couple of reasons why Iraq decided to do that. First of all, um, come to find out that Iraq actually owed Kuwait about $16 billion, which doesn't seem like a lot in, in, in the national debt that we have, but uh, I would exchange that gladly, uh, you know, with our debt for that debt. But, but you know, the problem was Saddam Hussein, he, he couldn't pay it back. And so he decided that if he just invaded him and took over, that his debt would be annihilated and wiped out. But the second reason why he decided to invade Kuwait is because Kuwait was very oil rich. And, and Saddam Hussein was greedy. And so he wanted all their, all their wealth. Now, the problem was, is that nobody in, a, in, in, in the world really knew how strong the Iraqi military was. And, uh, and so as a result of that, America, they recruited about 42 different countries to create a coalition to come against Iraq during that time. And in addition, there were all kinds of rumors. I remember because I was right at that drafting age of being drafted in the military. And there were all kinds of rumors going around that they were talking about it, it, in invoking the draft again, because they just weren't sure how much manpower they were going to need uh, to, to, to go up against I Iraq. And this made a lot of my friends nervous. Um, and then a, a lot of my, then some other friends, they, they were inspired and they went in and they, they went down to the recruiter's office to get recruited. Now, during that time, recruiting is really something that's kind of a simple, a simple process, actually. It's a simple concept once you sign up. And, and the concept basically goes like this. If you were ever recruited, you know what this is all about. Okay, but basically, when you sign up with the recruiter's office, here's what they promise to, that will happen, is that they will teach you, they will train you, they will assign you to a mission, and you are expected to follow orders. That is the promise that a recruiter will give to you, okay? And the reason why recruiting is so important is because everything that is related to mission success depends on the soldier's ability to follow what? Orders. And so, so, so the recruiting process is pretty easy. We're going to train you. We're going to teach you. We're going to send you out. And you will follow those orders because if, if those orders don't get followed, well, the mission success depends on it. And so what happens then is that if one person in that team, if, one, if there's a breakdown of one person, if, the, if, if somebody falls short, if, if, there's, if there's too many mistakes that happen, if people fail to do their job, then what happens on a military strategy is that the mission is delayed and sometimes actually the mission becomes jeopardized to be able to be completed at all. Now, what's interesting is, is that whenever we read the Bible cover to cover, you can find this theme all throughout Scripture that Jesus' followers, that would include us, we're actually being recruited into the Lord's army. Okay, so, so the concept of Scripture repeats this again and again and again, that if you choose to become a Jesus follower, then you are considered part of his team. You are considered part of his army. You are recruited for a purpose. You have a responsibility now to uphold. You have a responsibility to maintain. You have orders to follow. Okay? You, you have things to accomplish. It's not just get saved and then just, woo, got my fire insurance card. Now, now I'm good to go. Okay, no, 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 no. Jesus' followers are all about God's army. And the Lord expects us to be taught, to be trained, and to participate in his mission. Because here's the reason why. Failure to do so leads to mission success. The failure to follow orders, failure to do what Jesus wants us to do, it, it impinges on the very mission of God, and it delays his mission. 
and sometimes even jeopardizes his mission altogether, which raises an interesting question. What is it precisely in Jesus' mission? What, what, what is his mission? And, 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 and what does he expect us to do about that? that? That's just a great question. And so throughout this series, we've actually talked a lot about the what part, what is Jesus' mission? We've talked a lot about that throughout this series. And I encourage you to go back and listen to some of those some of those videos if you if you haven't had a chance to okay and uh, and we've talked a lot about those different things throughout this series but before we get into our mission part and what Jesus expects from us what i want to do today is i want to just simplify in the most simple of ways how i how scripture identifies the mission that Jesus is all about okay so I want you to, to, to just follow along with me here in this scripture. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to turn there. Most of you could probably quote this scripture from memory. You might quote it from an older version. But today we're going to read a scripture out of the New Living Translation uh, because I don't want it to be for rote. I want you to understand the depth of what one author wrote of God's mission. And, 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 and here's the scripture. You probably have seen this before, John chapter 3, verse 16. Anybody ever heard this one? Okay, I want, you to, I want you to follow along the way this is written here in the New Living Translation. It says this, that, that, this, this is how God loved the world. In other words, this is how God demonstrated his love to the world. That what did he do? He, he what? He what? He loved, so he, and he gave because he, he loved. And he gave his one and only son. So that, how many? Everyone. How many? Everyone. Everyone who decides to believe in him, they wouldn't perish, but they would experience what? Eternal life. God loves, so he what? He gave because he? God loves, so he gave. He loves, so he gave. He loves, he loves, he loves so much that he gave, and he gave, and he gave, and maybe we should make this present tense, he gives, he gives, he continually gives to us because he continually loves us. Loving and giving are directly linked, aren't they? Not sure? Hey, let, let, let's put this in our language. <clears throat> Anybody here happily married? Okay, now if you don't have your hands raised and you're married, well, come and see Pastor Larry and Dolores right afterwards. They're going to help you. Okay, they've been married 50, 56, 50, 57 years. Okay, they, they got a few things under their belt. Okay, they can help you out. But, <clears throat> but isn't it true that, that, that we give because we love? Okay, God loved us so much that he gave to us. And that's what we do to the people that we love. We, we, we give to our spouse. We give to our kids. And if you have grandkids, you can't stop giving because you love them so much, right? I don't have any savings right now because it all just went to my grandchild. I mean, we're constantly buying him toys and shirts and cool kid stuff and noisemakers. His parents love the noisemakers, so just buy him lots of noisemakers, okay? okay? The point is, is we give because we what? We love. And because we love, we give. But I want you to notice this next part here because John carries on. He's not through. Now, that's normally where we stop, okay? But John carries on and he says this. God sent his son into the world not to judge. Now, that's a different concept than what some of us have been taught to believe. But John says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Now, you might have been raised with this concept in mind that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that they're just kind of sitting up there in their lofty little thrones, and they're looking down through the clouds and God has this mean, this mean look on his face with a beard that's just more impressive than mine. And he holds in his hand lightning bolts. And he's just waiting for you to screw up. 
because he is going to strike the minute that you do. And for some of you, that is the way that you were raised. But that is not how John, who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and was taught by Jesus, that's not how John, in his personal testimony, describes Jesus at all. That instead, God loved, so he gave, so that Jesus could come to save us. So throughout the entire series, we've described lots and lots and lots of ways in which Jesus has demonstrated God's love that he didn't come to earth just to, just, to, just to have an explanation of God, but he came to be the best explanation of God so that all mankind could experience a personal relationship with the Heavenly Father. So let's talk. Let's shift gears here. Okay, so that's the most simplistic reason why Jesus came. But, but today, we're going to conclude our series today on this topic of why did Jesus. And we're going to talk about our mission what our mission is, what, what Jesus is, is asking us to be involved with. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. Go to the New Testament, and it's the very first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28. Go to the very end of that book. If you go to, if you go to Mark, you went too far, just back up one page, and you'll be at Matthew chapter 28. Now, by the time that we read our scripture, Jesus, he, 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 he was born to earth, he, he obtained this earthly body through Mary, as we know. And, and, but, but it's like he knew that that wasn't going to last forever, okay? Because he had a body just like ours, and bodies get old, and they die. And some of us, this past week, experienced memorial services where we attended people who, who just got old, and they passed away, or there were circumstances in our bodies, they just don't live forever. And so likewise with Jesus, he knew that his body wouldn't live forever. And so it's pretty evident that when we read the New Testament, and in fact the entire scripture, that, that God's intentions were never for Jesus to live on earth forever anyways. Okay, So Jesus chose to come and to die for our sins, and eventually ascend to heaven where he returns until he returns again to rapture us back up with him. But prior to that, what Jesus does before he dies and resurrects to, to, from, from the dead, he recruits 12 guys. And he actually had lots and lots and lots of disciples, but the 12 we are kind of familiar with because those were like his, like his key leaders, his apostles, if you will. And he taught them and he trained them. And he passes off a mission to them to carry into all the world. And by the time that we get to our scripture this morning, Jesus has been crucified, he's resurrected, and then he spends 40 days from that moment of time of resurrection to the time that he ascends to heaven, and he's mingling with people, he's talking with people, he's showing all kinds of amazing miracles and wonders and signs. He does all these amazing things, and a few days before he's getting ready to ascend to heaven, he tells his disciples, he sends word. He says, hey, I want you to go to this mountain. I want you to meet me there because I'm going to give you a mission. And so Matthew, he describes what that mission is and how Jesus expects his followers to carry through with that mission. Okay, here it is, Matthew chapter 28. Let's start reading in verse 18. Okay, here's what he said. Jesus came and he told his disciples... I have been given how much authority? All authority in where? Heaven and earth. Now, the reason why Jesus says this is because Jesus had actually lived a sinless life. And in, in, in fact, he never sinned, not one time. Now, some of you think that you've never sinned. Some people act like they never sin. But... Jesus, he never did. He actually never did. He never sinned. And because he lived, lived this sinless life, he became the perfect individual to become a sacrifice for our sins. And so as you know, he, was, he died for us, but he rose again three days later, and God gave him, because of that, God gave him all authority in both heaven and on earth. And so Jesus, he's now getting ready to commission his disciples. And he says, because I have been given all authority on earth, here's what I'm going to tell you. And here's what he says. Therefore, 
Therefore, because I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore you go. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. Now, this little scripture right here that we've just read, <clears throat> theologians, people that are way smarter than me, that read the Bible and study, that's like their full-time job. And I know you think that's my full-time job. It's, it's part of my job, but it's not like what I do all the time, okay? Um, but theologians that are way smart, they, they refer to this little portion of scripture as the Great Commission. Okay. In, in, in fact, it's the reason is, is because it's Jesus' his final instructions to his disciples, and, 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 and he's commissioning them towards their life mission. That, that once they've become and chosen to become a Jesus follower, we as well are included to be commissioned to this same cause. In fact, the reason why you became a Jesus follower is because somebody chose to participate in this mission for your benefit. Therefore, you not only have a responsibility to Jesus to carry out this mission, but almost you almost have an obligation to the person who commissioned you to carry on this same work for the purpose of leading others to Jesus. So here's a couple of things that you want to know because there's just so much that we can unpack in this verse and we could like spend an entire series on this thing. But I want to draw your attention to just a couple of little things as it relates to us as army recruits, okay? <clears throat> things that will help us carry out our mission for the cause of Christ. And so the first instruction that we see Jesus say is, is he says, therefore, what's the word? Go, therefore go. Now, Jesus isn't specific about this. <clears throat> so in... in the way that I would interpret this to mean is that the first thing we need to do to accomplish his mission is to just go somewhere, go anywhere, right? Just go somewhere, go anywhere for the purpose of Jesus. Just go somewhere, go anywhere, anywhere that you want. Okay. Now this little word go really implies the idea that, um, that Jesus doesn't want you to stay where you're at. You know, you can never accomplish going somewhere if you're content to remain in the same place all the time. You have to take a step. You have to move out. You have to go elsewhere. You have to move beyond where you're at because you're either moving forward or you're stuck. I don't want to be stuck. Anybody with me? Okay. So Jesus implies that there is this intentionality on our part to go somewhere, to go anywhere for the purpose of his mission. Now, here, here, here's a thought for you, is that armies, and, and some of you are military, some of you are military people, okay? One of the things that you'll understand is that armies cannot accomplish its objective if it is not willing to move out. You got to move. You got to go somewhere. You got to you got to you got to conquer the enemy. You got to stick it to the enemy. So the question that we might ask is, okay, God, well, where 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 do you want us to go? Well, Jesus, he 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 says this in this verse. He says, I want you to go into all the nations. In other words, Jesus says, I want you to go into all the world. I want you to tell every people group. I want you. I want you to include everybody in this message. <clears throat> I want you to just go anywhere and communicate. Now, in, in our world, in our personal lives, honestly, this is pretty unlikely for, for most of us, isn't it? To just pick up and go somewhere else in the world for the purpose of Christ. I mean, we, we just can't do that because we have responsibilities and... and um, you know, we have families and, you know, we, 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 how are we going to pay for ourselves once we get over there and all these logistics. But, but here's the thing that 
the, the idea that each of us should go somewhere into the world to preach the good news, that, that might be a little bit unlikely, but that doesn't mean that we can't support those people who have been called to do that sort of a thing, which is precisely why we have a lot of missionaries come through our church to tell their story, because we want to provide you with an opportunity to send and to go vicariously through them, really. So really, you are. When you give to and you support a world missionary, somebody like we like one of our most recent ones was, was a missionary to Iran. Imagine, imagine somebody who's called to go to that people group, how difficult that would be to be in that kind of a culture to just share Jesus, to share the love of Jesus. Now, some of you. My name is Brian. I'm your friend, okay? So let me just say this softly. Some of you are so prejudiced against the Arab people and against the Persians that you would never want to ever set foot in in Iran. And yet Jesus came to die for those people. He came to save those people. And so you may not want to go, but there are people who do and are feel called to go. And so we can send them. We can support them, okay? And so... So it's why we invite a lot of missionaries. But, but here's another consideration for you as it relates to this whole thing. And then we're going to move on, okay? But, but whenever Jesus says, I want you to go into all nations, what he's really identifying here is I want you to communicate this to all people. Now let's bring that into our world a little bit. Because that is something that each of us can be involved with. Okay? <clears throat> it can include... Your, your family people, it can include your work people, it can include your business people that you do business with, it includes your, your team people, it, in, it can include your coffee people, it can include your grocery people, it can include whatever people you bump into, your neighbor people, right? It, it, it can include all of these people. It can include people that don't even fit into your little cultural world that you created for yourself. You can go outside of your own culture and communicate the good news of Jesus to another culture. You can do that. You can step out. You can move out to another culture, like Portland, for example. Or downtown Medford, for example. You get what I'm saying? Okay. See, see, see the point is, is that Jesus' mission, the first step is for us to just go. To just go somewhere to talk to people. And, 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 and we, we just can't be content to stay where we're at and to just hold this little precious gift that God has given us. All to ourselves and just ah, my little precious, it's mine. We can't do that. We need to be intentional about moving out of our comfort zone and into a world that desperately, desperately, dead more than ever needs to hear the story of Jesus. So the question is: Is that once we decide to go, <clears throat> what do we do then? This is the part that may be a little scary. Because Jesus says the next thing we got to do is, what? And some of you went, oh, I don't like that part. It's so hard. This is scary to some of us because we think that what Jesus is implying here is that you have to be educated. That you have to know all things about God and Jesus in the Bible to be able to share Jesus. Can I just say something to you that if that were Jesus' intentions, I just promise you that none of us here today would be Jesus' followers. Because you and I, we can never, ever, ever attain enough information, enough knowledge, enough wisdom to ever really feel confident about leading other people to Jesus. You will never attain that kind of knowledge. In fact, when you read the Gospels, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story of Jesus and the 12 men that followed him around and the hundreds of others that considered themselves followers of Jesus, there were a lot of things. I mean tons of things that Jesus' apostles, that they didn't know before Jesus sent them out. In fact, what we see in their story is that they just kept learning. They, they, they kept growing. They certainly made a lot of mistakes. I mean, tons of mistakes. That, that, so, 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 but as they learned, as they grew, as they were gaining information about how this whole thing works and learning more about God, learning more about Jesus, learning more about his purpose, his ways, he, they, they just kept learning and passing that on to other people. They didn't allow their lack of knowledge to stop them from going and making disciples. Now, if you study this little word disciple here, okay, now I know that most of you, you're not going to do this, so, so I do this for you, okay? This little word disciple here is an interesting little word because we've kind of, we've kind of like over-spiritualized this thing and we just made it way too complicated, okay? But, but really, we, we all do this, okay? We all make disciples in one way or another, Okay, because a disciple really, by definition, and how Jesus used this concept, is to really just become a follower of the teacher's conduct of life. And the reason why you behave the way that some of you do is because you followed the conduct of life of your parents, or an uncle, or a friend who had influence on you. You, without even understanding it, became a disciple. And in turn, you have also been discipling through your own, what? Conduct of life. So when Jesus says, I want you to go and make disciples, he's really just saying, I just, I just want you to become a follower of the, of the teacher's conduct of life, and I want you to be the teacher and demonstrate a conduct of life. Now, that kind of simplifies things a little bit. So, so, so in our language, the way that we might make this applicable is maybe perhaps we might identify a disciple this way. <clears throat> that if we're going to disciple somebody, we're basically just teaching someone what you know and showing them as you grow. See how that works? How? Through my conduct of life how I live my life, how I demonstrate that in front of other people. Am I going to make mistakes? Okay, just making sure I'm in the right crowd. Because if not, I'm going to resign and we're just getting, you know, you guys can find out and figure out. Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm with people who make mistakes. Anybody here do that? Anybody here still fall into sin? Huh? Okay, I'm making sure that I'm in the right crowd, okay? Because I don't want to be a bunch of, around a bunch of people that never sin. Okay. Okay. So, what we're talking about here, teach someone what you know and show them what you grow as you grow, which means that no matter how much or how little you know about Jesus, no matter how much or how little you understand about Scripture or God or any of that, our responsibility is just simply to share that knowledge with someone. And as you grow, as you learn, as you develop, you're just constantly teaching your disciples. You, you with me? Okay, now, the other part that we talked about is, is this conduct of life thing. And some of you are like, oh boy. Okay, because... This raises an interesting question, and this isn't a condescending question. This is just a self-evaluation question. Are you really satisfied with your conduct of life? Are you satisfied with your conduct of life specifically as it relates to being a Jesus follower? Are you? Are you the kind of person that just does your best to just live for Jesus and live how Jesus would demonstrate God? Do you do that? Now, now, now again, I'm not asking you that to make you feel bad. I'm just, I, I'm just wondering if you're just satisfied with your 
personal life's conduct. Because your conduct, it will never disqualify you from making disciples, but it certainly affects how strongly people are drawn to the Jesus that's inside of you. So, for example, I mean, if you're if you're one of these grumpy religious Christians and you just got there was a commercial back in the day that had bitter beer face. Anybody remember that? Bitter beer. And you're all contorted down, and you're like, oh, I love Jesus. I mean, if, if you're like one of those people, it's kind of hard for me to want to really be your friend, right? I mean, if, if you're one of these people that are just constantly judging other people and just demeaning other people, and you're just hard on them because they don't measure up to your expectations, you know, I mean, if, you're, if your mouth and your anger and your behavior is just repulsive to people, if those things don't reflect Jesus, I mean, it will never, your conduct will never prevent you from being a disciple maker, but it certainly will be more difficult for people to see Jesus in you. It, you see how that works? So the point of it is, is that all of us, me included, I'm constantly working on it. My wife is, the, is, is so gracious. I wish I were more like that. I'm working at that. She, she, she's a good helpmate. She demonstrates that to me. I wish that I were more gracious with people. Is that okay to admit that? Okay. The point of it is, is that all of us need to, to strive to be more Christ-like. Not just to have an explanation of God, but to be an explanation of God. And that's why Jesus came. And he's hoping that you will follow that very example. Because the disciple, what a disciple is, is that we're just supposed to follow Jesus' conduct of life. And in turn, we're supposed to demonstrate that same conduct. That we should be recruiting other people as well to follow that. Now, the third thing to accomplish Jesus' mission, and then we're going to wrap this up, is Jesus says he wants you to go make disciples and then what? Baptize people. And so, we're going to talk a lot more about this next Sunday because in, in a couple of Sundays, we're going to actually practice water baptism. And so next Sunday, I'm going to answer all your questions that you ever wanted to ask about water baptism. Okay, And I'm going to answer them before you even have a chance to ask them. See, that's how good this is going to be next Sunday. Okay, So come next Sunday, we're going to talk more about water baptism. But, but in a nutshell, here's what I want you to understand. When Jesus uses this word baptize people... He wants you to baptize them in, in the name of the who? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? What he's saying is he's saying, I want you to immerse people. I want you to saturate people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So in essence, that's what he means by that. Now, of course, there is a practical side of this. Okay, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But, but here's the thing that we've been kind of learning throughout this series, and it is, that, is that whenever we have a question about life, what Jesus wants us to do is he wants us to demonstrate the, the, the greatest commandments of all Scripture, and that's this right here, to love God and to love people. So when Jesus says, I want you to go and baptize people, He's saying, I just want you to go. I want you to demonstrate your love for God and demonstrate your love by people of people and just immerse people, saturate people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about that next Sunday, a little bit more, because obviously there's a physical part of this, and we're going to address that next week, okay, the next couple of weeks, um, and, and, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so... so let, let's talk about wrapping this up here today because some of you are ready to go home and I'm getting hungry. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> making disciples <clears throat> is the very last thing that Jesus told us to do. This is the mission. This is the command. He wants every one of his followers to go and accomplish this stuff. Okay? Whether it be next door, 
whether it be to another country, Jesus came to teach, to train, and to send us out to accomplish a mission. Listen, how well we do, how well we answer this cause determines how effective that mission can be. Just like in our regular army, the same principle applies here. This responsibility has been passed down from generation to generation, generation, and now it's our turn. We have a responsibility to join the army and to be sent out on a mission. So here's the question that I want you to consider as we wrap this up today. <clears throat> if making disciples is what Jesus expects, why aren't we doing that? That's a great question. I came up with a couple of reasons that I think that are probably your answers. Because Pastor Brian, it's scary. Pastor Brian, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Pastor Brian, I don't, I don't feel like I'm worthy to do that. Pastor Brian, I, I don't know very much. Brian, I... What happens if they ask a question that I don't have an answer to? Okay. Or, or, or maybe your life conduct falls a little bit short of where you would like it to be and you, don't, and you feel like you're disqualified. Okay. Listen, I, I just want to take all those, those questions, those answers, those responses, and I just want to just erase all of that right now. And I want to take all of the fear out of disciple making for you. Can I, can I do that here as we wrap this up? Okay, okay, just making sure. <clears throat> that wasn't a rhetorical question, okay, that was a response. Okay, so, <clears throat> you remember in week number two of this series, for those of you that were here, you remember we, we, might, we might have talked about a guy <clears throat> that Jesus healed the blind man in John chapter nine, and, and Jesus comes along and there's this interaction and the blind man was born this way from birth, and Jesus says, listen, the disciples ask, was it this man's fault or his parents' fault? Who sinned here? Who, who created all this? Because that was the mentality of the day, that this was God's judgment. And Jesus says, none, none of that is true. This happened so that the glory of God could be shown through him. And through the process of this, <clears throat> the, the, Jesus heals this man. He goes away. The religious leaders, they come, they recruit this man, and they bring him in, they drag him in there before their little throne room, and, and they, they question him, and they interrogate him. And how he responds is such a, has such major implications for us as it relates to this topic. Okay, so I'm just going to read just three short little verses here to just tie this all together, and then we're going to go eat a steak or something, okay? Okay, okay so, so, so get the picture. He's standing in front of these guys, and here's how he responds. He says, look, he says, I don't know whether this Jesus guy is a sinner or not. Couldn't tell you anything about him. I was blind. Okay. I don't know. I've never seen him before. So he, so he says, I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied. Okay. In, in, in other words, what, what he's saying to these men is, look, he says, you're asking me to provide you with information that I haven't learned yet. You're asking me a question I don't know the answer to. There's so much more to Jesus than what I can respond to right now because I just met the man. But here's what he says. He says, but here's what I know is I was blind and now I can see. I was blind and now I can see. This is my life before I met Jesus. Jesus came to me. We had this relationship that started and now this is my life now. You seeing the pattern there, anybody? This is what my life was like. Jesus came to me. I met Jesus. And this is what my life is becoming. It's different. So then they carry on and they say, well, but what did he do? 
they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed. I love this. I just love this. This is like one of my favorite stories in all the New Testament. Look, the man exclaimed. I told you once. You did, didn't, weren't you listening to me? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple too? Listen, listen to me. This, 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 this story has so many ampl- implications for us as disciple makers because what Jesus is saying is, look, you don't have to know very much to be able to tell people about what I've done for you. But you can't be content to just stay where you're at. You have to go. You have to get up. You have to move. In other words, it all begins with this right here. Tell your story. You all have a story of what life was like before Jesus. Jesus came and now it's different. Yeah, maybe it's not what I want it to be quite yet. Maybe I'm falling short in some areas, but here's what I know as I used to be blind, but now I can. Okay. This is how my life was. This is how I can't explain it. I don't fully understand it. I can't even tell you how he did it. All I know is that this interaction between me and Jesus made a difference. Do you want to be his disciple too? It's literally, I'm just telling you, it's literally that easy. Now, here, here's what I want you to understand. If people reject your story, if they reject Jesus, if they choose not to become a disciple of Jesus because of your efforts, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. And I just want to encourage you that if that happens, you just love those people. You just keep on loving them. You just be the best demonstration of Jesus that you know how to be. But don't let that hinder you. Okay? Just carry on. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Okay? But here's the thing is that if they are interested, here's how this sums up for us. Just teach someone what you know and then show them as you grow. Just keep doing that. Just teach them what you know. It may not be very much. Just teach them. Then show them as you grow. This is what disciple making is all about. It's not complicated. Regardless what the church taught you, regardless what your Sunday school teacher taught you, regardless what your catechism taught you, regardless of any of the stuff that you were taught, disciple making is not that hard. It's just simply tell your story, do your best, Tell them what Jesus did for you, okay? To tell your story and show them, teach them what you know, show them as you grow. And I love how Jesus ends this whole commission thing, this mission, because he doesn't just leave them hanging on the command, but instead he gives them a reminder, and here's what he says. Matthew chapter 28, he says, and I want you to be sure of this, that I am with you. How often? Even to the end of the age. So when you're in the middle of making disciples and people rejecting the Jesus story, or you're a little bit nervous talking to your kids, or you're a little bit nervous talking to your friends, you just remember that Jesus is the commander of the army. And he's way better than Stonewall Jackson because Stonewall Jackson got shot. But the reason why in the Civil War, the reason why they loved General Stonewall Jackson is because he was out on the front lines with all of his soldiers. And Jesus is saying the same thing to you, that he's with you. He's not just sending you out and saying, good luck. I'm going to hang out back here at headquarters. No, 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 no. He's saying, look, I'm with you. I'm with you always, even to the ends of of the age. In other words, since you're his recruit, he's not going to leave you alone, so you have nothing to fear. And that's why Jesus, that's why Jesus came to live among us. That's why he became human, to live among us, to demonstrate. And he's just hoping that you will buy into this mission as well, to lead your friends. Because some of you, you have kids 
that you didn't raise them in church because you didn't know any better. You came to, to Jesus later in life. Some of you have friends that you kind of kind of screwed up with a little bit and you know you weren't the best example and you used to live a certain way with them and now you've come to Jesus and you're not sure how all that works out. I just want you to know. Just tell your story. Just tell your story of what Jesus did for you. Here's how I used to be. Here's how Jesus came into my life. I can't explain it. Here's, here's, I, here's what I know now. It's my life. I got peace. My life, I'm better. Yeah, I fall short. And if people say, well, the, the church is just so hypocritical. The church got so many hypocrites. Listen, it's like we talked about last week. You know what I tell people? I just tell them, listen, there's, there's room for one more. Come on in. <clears throat> right? So tell your story. Teach what you know. Show me as you grow. Would you stand with me? Because I want to pray. Because some of you, you've been having some, you've got friends right now. You've got family and you've been talking to them and you're just not sure how to, how to break the ice. And so, you know, it just is what it is. You're a little nervous. I just want to pray that God would just eliminate all that fear out of you. Can I do that for you, Jesus? We're so thankful that somebody came to us and told us the Jesus story. Lord, we're so thankful that we know what our life was like before encountering you. And then, Lord, you came to our lives and you have made a major improvement. We're so thankful that we've been working on things in our own heart and our own life for so long and we fall short of that. But, Lord, somehow you have the ability to come in and take all of our messes and just clean them up. And more importantly, Lord, you forgive all of that. And Lord, we want so desperately for our kids to know, we want so desperately for our neighbors to know, our friends, our best friends, our, our family, that, that our distant relatives. We want them to know and have that same experience so that they can have eternal life as well. But God, sometimes we're afraid. We're a little nervous. We're, we're just not sure how people are going to respond. And Lord, I just pray that right now that the peace of God would just saturate your followers, that they would have nothing to fear, that they would remember that you're with us. In Jesus' amazing name, amen. So listen, if you want to become a Jesus follower, <clears throat> if you want to join the army, I just want to encourage you to just begin to follow Jesus. That's all he asked, is just to follow. Just take a step. Just move out from where you're at. Just begin to follow Jesus. Begin to, you know, even the disciples didn't believe that he was the son of God at first. But they just continued to follow. And eventually that became a revelation to them. I, I, I want to encourage that for you. Now, if you're ready to believe that Jesus is Lord, all you got to do is believe that in your heart. That he's raised from the dead and just confess that he's Lord with your mouth. And Paul says you're saved. Great. For some of you, you're a little nervous. You're not sure. You're kind of just dancing on the edge lines. Listen. Just begin to follow. And so maybe that just means that maybe next week you check back in with us online or maybe you, maybe you attend a church where, you're, where you live at locally. Begin to read your Bible. Maybe you just pray. God, I'm not sure you're up there. I'm not sure. Okay, just, just talk to him. Just take a step. Just begin to follow. Okay? Now, one of the things that we do in our church that is a lot different, maybe perhaps, than a church as you've ever been involved with is, is we just wrap our time up with a question. And just before we dismiss our online crowd, I want to give you 60 seconds to, to make an application because I don't, I don't want to just give you information. I want you to begin to apply this to your life. Okay. That, that okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Carla. I heard that. The rest of you, you just, you just follow Carla's example. Okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take 60 seconds before we go today, and, and I want you to just, just turn to your neighbor, somebody you came with, maybe you don't even know them, maybe that's better that you don't know them, okay? And I want you to just answer, answer this simple question for 60 seconds. Each of you take a minute, okay? Who do you need to tell your Jesus story to? Who do you need to explain your story to? Who? And here's the reason why that question is so important is because today, as we were talking about this, the Holy Spirit was putting names and faces into your mind all morning long. Am I right or am I right? 
So here's what I want you to do. I want you to just turn to your neighbor and I want you to just answer this question. Then before you go, I want you to just direct your attention up here. Okay, 60 seconds, go for it. Joining us for Bible therapy today. We're so glad you're a part of our online community. We'd really like it if you would leave us a comment and while you're watching so that we know you're there. If you have any questions or comments, you could contact Pastor Brian directly with an email at reachus at relevantchurch.org, or you could also like and subscribe. We really like to know you're listening and we hope to see you again next week. Peace be with you. God's blessings.